Let's see. That's it. Uh, today we'll meet the mud people. Gee. And we'll voyage to see what's on the bottom. Ooh, broken hell looks okay. Oh, whatever that is. And we'll confuse animals. Gee, anyone? Okay, okay, let's see. Oh, oh, whoa, oh, oh. whoa. Oh, and we'll visit weird places. You? And I need a, uh, whoa, what's this? A spaceship. It's out of control. This video is brought to you by Patreon. Patreon. Made with real cheese. So, a lot was going on with Nickelodeon in 1984. Financial shakeups in Warner Amex resulted in a lot of restructuring, which resulted in splitting MTV and Nickelodeon into their own division, which resulted in new management, which resulted in Cy Schneider stepping down as head of the channel, which resulted in program manager Jerry Layborn getting a temporary promotion, which resulted in a reworking of the management structure, a clarification of goals, an intense push for research via test audiences, and a complete overhaul of Nickelodeon's visual brand. The channel was juggling so many balls, how could they possibly have time to, you know, make television shows? While Nickelodeon imported a lot of fun and important shows this year, including the introduction of animation to the channel, which we'll get to next time, production for original programming reached an all-time low in 1984. This was the year the final new episodes of Pinwheel aired, production having been capped off with a live tour the previous summer. Reggie Jackson's World of Sports, Kids Rights, and Against the Odds hadn't had new episodes in a few years, and Livewire was scaled back to a once-a-week program. This left Mr. Wizard's World and Standby Lights, Camera, Action, which weren't the most expensive programs to make, and you can't do that on television, which Nickelodeon was only a co-producer. 1984 would see the introduction of Nick Rocks, but that was just bumpers around music videos. Not all that complicated. Really, there was only one big new production introduced in 1984, and it is fantastically representative of this chaotic, transitional time for the channel. Today, we're talking about Out of Control. You're a male person, right? Yes and no. I'm a female male person. Oh, you're a female, female letter, letter carrier. carrier. <laughs> yep, that's me, Lydia the Lady Letter Lugger. Not snow, nor rain. Nor hail, nor mustard, nor a great big 16 ton. No, don't say it! What makes this show interesting from a history of Nickelodeon perspective is that Out of Control was originally pitched to and greenlit by Cy Schneider, but it would be up to Jerry Laybourne to get it over the finish line a show with one foot in the channel's failed past and one foot in the channel's successful future. The basic pitch here is that Out of Control is a spoof of the popular news magazine format, a goofy take on programs like, well, going great. Hosted by Dave Coulier, the show rotated through a number of reoccurring segments. It's probably true profiles weird characters like the mud people, who are just people covered in mud. Oh, Jay, we got to go. The store is having a sale and things are going dirt cheap. Ah, the mud people. Masters of muck merrily make their way through magnificent modern Manhattan. But what do they shop for? Look at this potting soil. Only a dollar fourteen. And look at this great mud sack. How not to do things gives you instructions on trying to build something like a derby car or stage something like a backyard carnival, usually to disastrous results. Rule number one, choose the right material. Stone, for example, is not a good choice for building a tree house. We suggest wood as it's easy to find around your neighborhood. Let's Eat sees Dave go to different kinds of restaurants and make jokes about the food, usually making a complete mess of the place. Okay, now I'm gonna make one. Okay, we got some dough, okay. Here's some dough. Oh, dough, 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 dough. Dough, dough, reach. Okay, here we go, we got the dough. Okay, it's got a little bit of flour on it. I'm gonna take it, put it into the flour. Now, we're taking it, kind of, yeah. 
Oh, yeah, <laughs> stretch your pizza break. Top it off with making some dough. Okay. I might name this one. <laughs> okay, now you have to start throwing the pizza dough. Uh, do we have any more dough? No more dough. Got a buck? <laughs> okay, well, the best thing you should do in this situation is you take your head off. Look at that. Insta dough, okay? Now you take it. First off, you take the tomato sauce. You got it? Okay, great. Oh, well, I'm going to spread it around. But the main thrust of each episode involved Dave and his crew trying, and often failing, to pull the show off without a hitch. It's sort of like the Muppet Show in that way. A band of misfits trying to put on a show, alternating between goofy segments and behind the scenes drama. Among the show's misfits, we have the shrill production manager Diz, played by Diz McNally, who harbors a secret crush for Dave. Try this on! It's you! Diz, what do they mean when they say, it's you? When people say it's you, that means that it's you, it's there, it's you, it's life, it's happening, it's now, it's, it's colors, it's gaudiness, it's glamour, it's glitter, it's absolutely wild, exciting glamour, and gaudiness, and, and, uh, this psycho blue nail. Cut it out! <laughs> There's the two rival reporters, the eager but clueless Angela, nicknamed Scoop, played by Jill Wakewood, and the scheming, always laughing Hearn, played by Marty Skiff. At Allen's, there are all kinds of saltwater tropicals, like these seahorses, for instance. Must be tough to put a little saddle on these guys, huh? Oh, and take a look at this starfish. Just the perfect pet for a star reporter, right, Hearn? Well, <laughs> here we are at the New York Lobster Exchange and Exotic Pet Store. And we're going to take a look at some of the rare pets that they have here. Some of my favorites are the rare North American snowfish. You see, what's great about these pets is they, they live in snow, and they, they sleep in snow with their eyes open, and, and they're real cheap to take care of, see? Because all you do is you just feed them snow. You just feed them snow, and they love it. Yum, 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 yum. Isn't that good? <laughs> There's Waldo, the show's technician and cameraman, who often wishes he had a bigger role in things, played by David Stenstrom. Uh, Waldo? Huh? Uh, Waldo, the the boom mic is on my desk and it should be up in the air. Oh, I guess I better fix it. Aw, oh, come on, cheer down, Waldo. Show a little less enthusiasm. <laughs> Just don't think I can, Dave. Not getting any mails really got me down. I'm just not in touch with the world. It's like nobody cares. And rounding it out is Supercomputer Ha Ha 32000 the show's comedy scriptwriter, voiced by Dave Coulier through a filter. Now listen up, ha ha. You have to start producing some real outstanding material for me. You see, I'm sort of a, a special guy now, so I need some real special material. Do you understand what I'm talking about? Now cut it out, Dave. My jokes are great. Come on, maybe you could try a little harder for me, Dave, okay? I don't understand, Dave. Usually, all the material I give you, you love. And to drive the Muppet Show comparison even further, the show had a critic character who would throw insults at the show between segments a la Statler and Waldorf, though animated and often seeing some kind of repercussion to his remarks. I always knew this show was full of hot air! Uh, hmm. Whoa! Whoa! This character was also voiced by Coulier. He did most of the character voices. Each episode of Out of Control has a theme, Sort of like you can't do that on television, at least in theory. But the amount of focus and adherence to that theme varied wildly. Let's go ahead and break down one episode, titled Magic. The framing narrative is Dave trying to help out a struggling magician of no talent, played here by a young pre-Mystery Science Theater 3000, Joel Hodgson. From Frostbite Falls, Minnesota, Presto the Pretty Amazing! Hello, Hi, Dave. Thanks for having me. I'd like to start off by doing a card trick. Oh, great. All right. Just think of a card, all right? Okay, I'm thinking of a card. Okay. Got it. <laughs> all right. Is this it? Nope, that's not my card. That's not it. Um, well, what was your card? My card was the Seven of Spades. Seven of Spades. Um, oh, come on, give him a chance, everybody. Well, this is as close as I could come by. The segments stick with the theme of magic at first. 
We have a how not to do things bit about performing magic, but then there's Hurry Up, a reoccurring segment of the show where Dave uses his hurry up machine to make things in a child's life go faster. In this case, cleaning the kitchen. It's just sped up footage. That's it. That's the whole joke. Then it's Alive, a segment about pets. Scoop profiles the world's richest dog. No magic. Spoilers, there's no more magic stuff in any of these segments. Next is adult education, where a child gives adults lessons in being a kid. Oh, hey, hey! Okay, you can come on up. Shake on it. Always be suspicious. Anyone can be a practical joker. Then there's a let's eat segment, but instead of the usual bits of Dave going to a restaurant, Hearn shows off how he cooks on a barbecue grill, and, um, fair warning, I'm not vegan, but this segment got me to the five yard line. I've come up with the perfect way of making the perfect burger. <laughs> yeah, natural burger maker. <laughs> oh, it's perfect, look at that. Oh, it's right there, the Italian method. I call this one my burger stand. Uh, my grandmother taught me this one. It's always good to, to use some herbal seasoning. Uh, a little bit of mustard. Ah, uh, yeah, and some ketchup. Oh, I always like the way red goes with yellow. And some cheese. Mmm, I can't believe how good this looks. And just a little bit of chocolate sauce. Mmm, chocolate sauce. Some oysters. And the crowning touch, toothpaste. Mmm, boy, does that look good. Mm, can't wait till I eat this. Personally, I was so turned off by this bit that I briefly turned into one of the adults in a gag commercial. <laughs> But yeah, nothing to do with magic. The theme is dropped in such a way that suggests that many of these segments were filmed without any idea as to which episode they would eventually slot into. Out of Control is the brainchild of director, producer, and co-writer Bob Hughes. Having graduated from the University of Southern California with a Master's of Fine Art in Cinema Studies, Hughes went to work at for Klein and, a Los Angeles-based consulting firm and production company founded by Bob Klein, which largely worked in advertising. Cy Schneider hired Klein and to help with Nickelodeon's image, and it was through them that the original Silver Ball logo was produced. This working relationship expanded into the shows themselves. In 1982, Bob Klein and his company would produce and do visual design for Against the Odds, as well as a half-hour television special for special delivery called Wild Rides, where they played rock music over footage of roller coasters. Oh, well, hello, young Matt Dillon. It's like three minutes of hanging on for dear life. The, the speed, the, the twists, the dips, and it got everyone into a frenzy, and it sent us out on a search for the the world's wildest rides, and that's what this is all about. Bob Hughes worked on all of this, but it wasn't until 1983 that the door was open to pitch a show himself. Originally titled The Out of Control Room, Cy Schneider greenlit the news magazine spoof and commissioned a 26 episode first season. So Hughes went to work getting a crew together. The key to this production would be the host, and Hughes knew exactly who we wanted. A young, hilarious stand-up comedian that we now associate with his role in the sitcom Full House, Hughes brought in none other than Bob Saget. My name is Bob. You know, some people say there's not much to do in Sacramento, and that's just not true. There's a lot of wonderful things here. There's a bridge, there's a tree, there's a, <laughs> there's a beautiful woman. There's the Railroad Museum. Excuse me, I'm making a commercial. <laughs> I think we have a problem here, okay? So Saget auditioned for the role of show host, but it wasn't quite working out. It wasn't quite what Hughes wanted. A few other people auditioned, including Joel Hodgson and uh, Thomas F. Wilson, aka Biff from Back to the Future. But Bob Saget had connections, and he had this friend he had made in the open mic circuit, a young man known for his trumpet noises and Popeye impressions. Yes, it's Dave Coulier. This guy went to Los Angeles about three years ago. They call him the spark plug of the Motor City out there. He's driving that town crazy. He's gonna be a superstar. He's got his own new TV series coming out, a comedy show called Out of Control. You're gonna see him at Night Live. St. Great Shores, Michigan. Let Dave Coulier feel welcome. So, Dave Coulier. The internet has no shortage of jokes about his hammy style and repetitive impressions of cartoon characters, 
But I want to be fair to the man, so I watched just about all of the Coulier stand-up I could find, every interview I could find, so that I could get a beat on his style and why his style is the way it is. Cable television affected everything, so of course it affected stand-up comedy. Before cable, the main way to perform your stand-up on television was being a guest on various talk shows, and the biggest game in town for that was The Tonight Show with Johnny Carson. And when everyone is aiming for the same goal, that meant approaching comedy in roughly the same way. The way that you made it in comedy was very clear, very simple, very straightforward. You went on Carson, you killed, you got called over to the couch, and the next day, you had your sitcom, you had your mansion, you'd been made. That's how you did it. Everyone knew that, all right? You can just, just ask Drew Carey, ask Jerry Seinfeld, and Ellen DeGeneres, and Bill Clinton. That's how you did it, all right? <laughs> All the comedians that I remember starting out with in DC, all the older ones especially, all the ones who told me over and over again, you gotta work clean, you gotta hone your five minutes, and you gotta go on Carson, and that's it. It all comes down to that. This is a massive oversimplification because I'm not doing an extensive history of stand-up comedy here, but the Johnny Carson is endgame attitude resulted in a lot of comedians having the same priorities. Tightly written jokes, subject matters with broad appeal, a certain amount of laughs per minute to maximize your six minutes on Carson. There's a lot of great comedy that came out of this, but if you wanted to try something different and be successful on that level, you were in for a rough ride. But then cable television came around and started to change the game. More channels, more diversity of programming, and on some of these channels you were allowed to swear. You didn't have to use the Carson model to find success. Your personality could be a major part of your act, and your subject matter could be much more niche. This is the era of Robin Williams and Gallagher. That's not to say that big personality stand-ups didn't find success before, but HBO and other cable outlets allowed for a reinvigorated amount of creative freedom and expression. For example, here's how Eddie Murphy looked on Carson, and here's how Eddie Murphy looked on HBO. Dave Coulier belongs firmly in the post-cable era of stand-up performers. In fact, Coulier would end up on Carson in 1984, and he hated it. I was not a Tonight Show comedian, you know, I do voices and characters and, um, uh, you know, I don't tell jokes in six minutes, and which you'll see <laughs> tonight. But, um, you know, I went and I, I kind of shoehorned myself at, into the Johnny Carson show mold and I did my six minutes and I was very unhappy about it and I really beat myself up and I thought, you know what, don't because you're on a whole different path than a Jerry Seinfeld or a Steven Wright or a Gary Shandling. Uh, but those were my peers. And so then the Howie Mandels and the Jim Carreys and started coming along and Robin Williams and Steve Martin and, it, and that just blew the doors open and I thought, you know what, don't be so hard on yourself because there's an entire spectrum of possibilities in the world of comedy now. Coulier had the air of a 10-year-old class clown put in the body of a 25-year-old man. And whenever he did get to telling stand-up jokes, they were often about his childhood and his relationship with his family. Fathers love to pull practical jokes on their kids. This is the reason why fathers enjoy having children. <laughs> fathers, you can see this. Fathers call their kids over all the time. Like, hey, come here. i got to tell you something. Come here. Come here. Pull my finger. <laughs> <laughs> Boy, they're happy when you pull that thing, aren't they? They do that dance. <laughs> Got you fourth time today, didn't I? <laughs> You're just going, Dad, that's sick. Quit it, Dad. <laughs> Grossing me out. I'm your son. Quit it. And this childlike persona extends into his impressions. Sure, he'll throw in the occasional celebrity impression, but for the most part, his obsessions are with the cartoons of his youth. Looney Tunes, Popeye, Rocky and Bullwinkle. What if that Bullwinkle voice was your real speaking voice? Wouldn't that be horrible? Hey, Al, how was your night last night? My God, I got hammered. <laughs> oh, no, you didn't wake me up. I've been up for a long time. I, yeah. Yeah, I, uh, I feel, uh, I feel great. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, what's that, Scoob? Rarana. Grab some for us, good buddy. See you in the van. Yeah, it's Scooby Snacks. <laughs> About the only time he's not in this nostalgic frame of mind is when he's making fun of black music. 
He does that um, more often than you think. What the hell am I saying, anyhow? Then I found out what these lyrics were. Oh, kill the white man, kill the white man. Oh, yeah, my little hut, it just all burned down. You know, I don't carry a crown because I got reggae. I say, buddy, put some shoes on your feet and get a job. You know, it's, uh, hey, come on. Dave Coulier, the whitest man in the world. But when you consider all of this, Dave Coulier as a children's television performer makes sense. There's a reason that most of his work pre-Full House was doing voices for cartoons, and it especially made sense for Nickelodeon. A goofy-looking adult comedian who makes a lot of weird mouth sounds? Well, that sounds an awful lot like Fred Newman over on Livewire. In fact, there's a whole episode of Out of Control that's just Dave Coulier and Fred Newman riffing off each other. So yeah, we may make fun of Uncle Joey these days, but in 1984, Dave Coulier hosting a kid's show made perfect sense. Out of Control was like comedy college for me. Bob Hughes was extremely generous with letting me exercise comedic freedom, so I learned a lot about delivery, timing, and being funny on camera. By the time I got to Full House, I was well armed. Coulier seemed to gel so well with the goals of the production that Hughes sought out other offbeat, relatively obscure acts to fill out the rest of the show. He grabbed an entire comedy troupe, the Duck's Breath Mystery Theater, best known at the time for their sketches on NPR, to write for the show and play many of the secondary characters. And then there was Diz McNally, a Los Angeles mainstay who was doing a lot of small theater at the time. When she entered Hughes' radar, she was doing this one-woman, ten-minute reimagining of Wizard of Oz, and when she was hired for Out of Control, this show of hers inspired the creation of Fast Told Fairy Tales, where Diz would retell a classic fairy tale in two minutes or less. Once upon a time, maybe six years ago, there lived a horrible, horrible, scary old witch, and she kept a beautiful girl locked up in a giant tower, and that girl's name was Rapunzel. Anyway, there was nothing to do up there in that tower, no video games, no MTV, not even Trivial Pursuit. So all she did was sit around and watch her hair grow, and boy, was her hair long. How long was it? It was so long, it took four years to wash, seven years to dry, and 20 years to color and condition. I loved all the clothes and the fashion and the makeup purple cheeks, blue eyeshadow. It was fabulous. All the clothes you see me wearing on Out of Control are my own clothes. I did my own makeup, which was a lot. Diz was a real sweetheart. Despite her crazy wardrobe and makeup, she was this caring, sweet, and thoughtful person underneath. She added this weird, pre cindy Lauper style to the show that kids loved. In many ways, Out of Control was the ideal of early cable. A bunch of weird, non-mainstream creators being given an opportunity to make a show their way. It's funny that Joel Hodgson was on the show because that's also basically the story of MST3K. But, 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 I can't say I like Out of Control that much. It doesn't work for me, and no, this is not a case of me hating on a show from before my time. A lot of Nickelodeon's earlier original productions were rerun as long as the channel felt they could get away with it, and even though Out of Control only had one season, it was still on the air as late as 1992, well within my time as a Nickelodeon viewer, and I didn't care for it back then either. I recognize that's not a unanimous consensus. I've talked to a lot of people who are very fond of this show, and that's fine. Comedy is a very subjective thing, and Out of Control's loud and obnoxious characters are appealing to some people, and I won't say they're wrong. But I do think there's some major conceptual issues here that keeps Out of Control from being the best show it could be. First off, Dave Coulier's child and adult body thing is great for a kid's show. It's just not so great for the straight man role. 
In this Muppet Show style program, Dave is effectively playing the Kermit the Frog role, aka the grown up in the room who is often put upon by his weird, self centered cast and crew. So he actually puts away the goofy noises and cartoon impressions more often than he breaks them out, and he's just not equipped to be the straight man. He looks bored half the time. Okay, Dave. All kidding aside, when are you going to give me that great story to do? Ern, as far as I'm concerned, the contest is over. And Angela won. I'm not going to fire you. You do a good job, too, at something. But uh, I'm not going to waste any of my time or anybody else's on your silly complaint. This does a complete 180 whenever he does his Let's Eat segments, where he gets to play with his food and make puns and do awful sight gags. Mm, I like chicken. It's me making I feel lucky because I'm not even in Kentucky. I'm a darn regret. Mm, I love chicken. <laughs> You're a bird. No, he's not. Yes, he is. I'm gonna eat it. <laughs> it's like they're two completely different characters. One that plays to his strengths and one that really doesn't. This matches the lack of focus in the off-dropped episode themes. It's a show less interested in working as a complete whole, and more in just throwing up whatever idea they have at the time. We all grew up in the 60s and the 70s, and we were all completely anti-authoritarian. That was an iconoclastic era, and all of us were still reverberating from that. It was just built into our DNA. We had suddenly been given this megaphone and we could now turn on authority and say what we wanted to say and say that what you're saying isn't always right. Anybody who knows me knows I'm all for anti-authoritarian works. But how in the world is out of control anti-authority? What authority is it possibly against? The default answer for a kids show is parents, teachers, the adult authorities in our lives. You can't do that on television takes that approach. All of the show's adult characters are absurd circus mirror reflections of grown-up authority. And under the guidance of Fred Allen Incorporated, the channel as a whole would take on a kids-only clubhouse attitude. Very, very rarely, Out of Control dips its toes into that theme. Mostly in the Hurry Up segments, which offers a power fantasy of getting your chores done at the speed of sound. But these moments are few and far between. Part of the problem is that all the main characters are adults themselves. Dysfunctional weird adults, but adults. Extensively, they are the authority. What the show needed was some kind of antagonist, like a channel head, a stuffy suit type who pops in to tell them to make a certain kind of show or they're off the air. Somebody for the characters to thwart, an authority to be against. Without that, Out of Control is about a bunch of idiots who continue to fail upwards in the most obnoxious way possible. Cy Schneider signed off on Out of Control, but it would be Jerry Laybourne's job to see it to air. She did send it through a round of test screenings, but so much of the show was already cemented by that point, so much money had already been spent that they might as well have not bothered. Laybourne never made any public statement on Out of Control, at least none that I could find, but Bob Hughes says she didn't much care for it. Laybourne didn't renew it for a second season, instead focusing on a new Roger Price sketch show in 1985, and the Out of Control crew went off to work on other projects. I think what it comes down to is that while Out of Control is interesting from a media history standpoint of obscure artists pulling their talents into one project at just the right time for that sort of thing, it doesn't gel as well as it could have with Nickelodeon because it wasn't made for kids. It was G-rated silliness, but Bob Hughes, Dave Coulier, Diz McNally, and all the rest made it for themselves. It worked for some kids. There's some strong nostalgia for this show. But there were shows on Nickelodeon before and after Out of Control that did what it was trying to do far better. A for effort, perhaps, and interesting to look back on, but at the end of the day, it's just a final gasp of the failed Cy Schneider era. Nickelodeon's success would have to be found elsewhere. Nick, 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 Nickelodeon. Nick, 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 Nickelodeon. Next time, it's here. It's finally here. Animation comes Nickelodeon. 
We've got secret agent rodents and fruit-themed superheroes. But first, a little cross-country dog adventure. Today's shout out goes to the 2012 Vulture article, Getting Out of Control by Matthew Clickstein. Clickstein is, um, a dum dum, and there's some interesting claims to this oral history of Out of Control. For example, it claims that Out of Control is the first show Nickelodeon produced in America, which, I mean, I guess I can see how you can come to that conclusion if you ignore Pinwheel, and by the way, and America Goes Bananas and Hocus Focus, and Livewire, and Pop Clips, and Reggie Jackson's World of Sports, and Kids Rights, and Against the Odds, and Standby Lights Camera Action, and Mr. Wizard's World. Yeah, yeah, if you don't count those, Out of Control is totally the first. But what Clickstein lacks in smarts, he makes up for in his ability to track down and interview people involved in Nickelodeon Productions. And this oral history was the foundation for this entire video. Thank you all for watching. We're here! Starting next episode, Animation Comes Nickelodeon. If you'd like to support Knickknacks and other Pop Arena projects, consider contributing to my Patreon. Every dollar is a step towards better production values, more research materials, and grilled cheese sandwiches. You can also support Knickknacks by liking the video, subscribing to the channel, hitting that bell icon for notifications, following me on Twitter, sending a one-time donation through Coffee, or is it Kofi, and sharing knickknacks with all your friends. Cartoons! We're finally doing cartoons!